Okay, so yes, we're gonna talk about circuit modeling. Uh, first, I wanna start off just by talking about time variant, time invariant linear circuits. Um, if we have linear time invariant circuits, we have a, a set of really good tools for modeling the behavior. Um, these circuits can be fully characterized by their frequency response. And it's really straightforward to calculate that because um, if we use Laplace transforms, the equations that describe the linear components are, are very simple. Um, in addition to that, we also have multiple really good tools for discretizing the Laplace descriptions of the systems. So once we have a continuous time description of the linear circuit, um, it's, it's, there's some pretty straightforward ways to go into discrete time. Most of the, uh, of the methods of discretization that are commonly used are um, based on a mapping from the S to the Z plane, such as a bilinear transform, a backward differencing. And basically, uh, all these methods involve just a, a model where we will model continuous time integration with a uh, differencing scheme in discrete time. And so um, the one thing I wanted to mention is just that the, the frequency response of a, disc of a discretized system in general isn't exactly the same as a continuous time system that it was uh, modeled after. But um, with the bilinear transform, at least, the frequency response will stay what I would call quite close up to about a quarter of the Nyquist uh, frequency. So um, as long as we're willing to go up to a, a, you know, an upsampled rate, it's possible to just use a bilinear transform on a, on a linear system and get a really good agreement. So um, not only that, but the, the bilinear transform is also pretty bulletproof because it's guaranteed to preserve stability of the system. So basically, I would consider the, the modeling of these uh, linear time invariant circuits to be kind of a, a solved problem. Like basically, we know tools that we can, that we can get to work on essentially any circuit. Um, we also have some really good tools for quickly calculating transfer functions of interconnected systems when we already have descriptions for the subsystems. So, um, you know, due to feedback theory, uh, for example, if we have a block H and a block G that are both linear systems that we've characterized, um, it's very easy to do manipulations and recover what we would call the closed loop transfer function of some bigger system that contains those smaller linear systems. Um, so uh, these tools make it really easy to model um, even high order uh, complex systems. However, if we have a feedback loop that's got any element within the loop that's either nonlinear or time varying, um, we can't use the closed loop description of, of that uh, system. Um, so uh, basically, the presence of the nonlinearity inside the loop um, makes it so that uh, we're forced to discretize the linear um, parts of the system separately. So here I've got a continuous time system. I've got two subfilters, H and G, that are inside a loop. And also, uh, you may not, uh, it's kind of a, I guess not a very uh, informative uh, diagram, but if you view this thing here to be a saturator, a nonlinear element that basically is a memoryless um, nonlinear function, what we're forced to do is we have to basically discretize H and G separately because we want to um, get the behavior of this nonlinear block as it's operating inside the loop. And the mechanism of the nonlinearity acts inside the loop. So if we were to, say, combine H and G into a closed loop system, we'd have no access to that nonlinear um, uh, element anymore. So now um, we're forced to separately discretize H and G. And uh, then we're left with the problem of how to combine those two discretized subsystems. And th so this problem is what's called the delay-free loop. Okay, so the the delay-free loop has been thought of as kind of an exotic or uh, maybe even a little bit mysterious system, but it's actually kind of a straightforward environment um, once we characterize the behavior of the discretized filters. So the key thing is that each uh, filter within the system in discrete time at any point in time is a linear system. So at time k, the output that comes out of the system is gonna be a linear function of the input. So if I have a filter with output y and input x, at any sampling instant, uh, y is just a linear function of x. And in more detail, basically what it is, is it's the b0 coefficient of that filter times x, and then we have to add in another element, which basically depends on the state of the filter. And um, what, what that state is, is it's basically the output that would be uh, produced by the filter for an input of zero. Um, but the key thing is that we have a linear relationship at any given time between the input and the output. Okay, so what happens if we want to connect multiple 
of these filters um, within a feedback structure. Basically, if we have n um, filters that we want to connect together, we'll get n linear equations, and then we're also going to have n unknowns because there's n uh, outputs to the various filters that we have to simultaneously solve for. So that's basically the delay-free part of the delay-free loop. Delay-free just means that we're going to have a simultaneous set of equations for multiple unknowns. So um, we can cast that as a matrix equation. And essentially, we're going we're to have a matrix whose elements only depend on the coefficients of the filters. So this is not a time-varying matrix. It has nothing to do with the states of the filters or the input. It's just the coefficients. So as long as the uh, system parameters don't uh, change, this matrix only has to be inverted one time. So we have to do the inverse of this matrix. And then basically, we're going to multiply it by um, a vector which has got all of the uh, time-dependent quantities inside it. So the states of the filters are in there and also the inputs of the system. So here I've rewritten that equation. And basically, um, all the states on the right-hand side here are known because the states of the filters um, basically only depend on the, the previous inputs. So everything inside this vector here is known at the time that we have to evaluate um, our system. So basically, in order to, to uh, make the system work, um, the time advance step is just simply a matrix multiply. And we've pre-computed the inverse of this system matrix and so that we can apply it. So um, you know, again, the inversion of this matrix can, can be done at setup. So that's the delay-free loop. Um, the drawback for, from the delay-free loop is basically just that most circuits don't usually form a loop. Um, so the loop implies that we have kind of a ring or a set of filters that are uh, in some order. And each filter will take as its input the output of just the previous filter in the loop. And what that does is it makes this matrix, um, this matrix ends up looking kind of like a, a generalized permutation matrix where every row of the matrix has all zeros except for one element. And that's, the reason that's true is because each filter is only being fed by the output of one other filter. But uh, in the case of modeling most circuits, we don't have that, that condition. Um, most of the time, we have a lot of multiple elements that are interacting with each other. And so that, that A matrix usually doesn't take the form of just a permutation matrix. It gets a lot less sparse. But in terms of computability, that doesn't really hurt anything, because we still have n equations for n unknowns. It's just that the matrix is, is more densely populated, the one that we have to invert. And um, that concept basically leads to most of the methods of, of circuit modeling that exist. So whether it's nodal analysis or state space or some other method, um, basically, um, we're always in a delay-free environment. And so I, I would think of all these methods as being generalizations of the delay-free system. Um, it's just that instead of having a loop, um, we, we just have an arbitrary collection of elements that are all interacting in some way with each other. OK, so let's take a look at that generically. Um, let's imagine, and this is something that happens pretty often, that we have a, a fairly large linear time invariant circuit that could have multiple elements and multiple states. It could be a, a high order filter. And then let's further imagine that we're going to connect it to just one single nonlinear element. So in this case, it would be a diode. Um, Basically, what happens is um, this system will produce uh, a little miniature delay-free loop where we have two unknowns. There's one unknown, which is the current going through the diode. The second unknown is the voltage that's across the diode. And now uh, we need to have two equations that we can simultaneously solve uh, in order to model the system. And so basically what happens is one of the equations comes from the diode itself. And if we're willing to model the diode as a memoryless device, which I think for audio purposes, is a pretty good um, approximation. We just get some memoryless instantaneous function that relates the current through the diode to the voltage across the terminals. And so that gives us one equation, which is nonlinear. And then we need a second equation. And um, I think the, the thing that's surprising about the linear systems is that for any linear system, uh, regardless of what the order of it is, um, we can always produce a single linear equation for any sample instant k. So if we, if we just go to any point in time, the description of this linear system as viewed from these two terminals is always it's a linear equation. And if we can recover that linear equation, then we can simultaneously solve it with the nonlinear element that's connected. 
And um, so basically the whole, the whole task of doing circuit modeling is to find these junctions between the few nonlinear elements and then the, the much more common linear subsystems. And the thing that matters is what happens at the junction or the interface between the nonlinear components and the rest of the, of the linear system. So um, the task just becomes finding that linear equation. And so um, I think you know, if there's one, one main point that I'd want to get across uh, for this whole uh, presentation, it would just be that this one, I think, kind of surprising fact that no matter what the linear system is, um, we're going to have as a function of time, so uh, this, this equation will vary as a function of time, but at any given sampling instant, we can always produce this, this linear equation. And basically what happens is the slope of this line um, depends only on the components, the, the values of the components in the linear system. But the, uh, the offset of the line, the position, like it, it'll get translated up and down. And that translation will happen basically partly due to the inputs to the system, but also partly due to the states. So if the system has reactances in it, um, those states will cause that load line to go up and down, okay? Um, so here's a graphical statement of the problem. Basically, we have the nonlinear function, which is the blue curve given by the diode. And the whole idea for modeling this circuit in combination is just that we have to find the intersection between a straight line, which is defined by the linear system, and this nonlinear function. And that's it. So um, after this point, everything uh, comes down to computational methods, uh, partly numerics, and partly dif different ways of setting up the problem. So what I was hoping to do is just go through a couple different common methods of doing these types of modeling and compare them. And then we can see basically what some of the pluses and minuses are for the different methods. But again, I think the, the, the most key element is just that we can always come up with this, this linear equation. And um, whatever method we're doing, that's, that's the task. And I think actually it applies even to wave digital filters. Um, you know, wave digital filters are in a, in a different space, but um, what happens is, um, as far as I know, all of the nonlinearities are generally described using um, a current and voltage relationship. So it, even if you're in the wave digital domain, what happens is when you have to connect to that nonlinear element, you're forced to go through a transformation from the wave variables to a real voltage and a real current. So this line relating the current and the voltage to each other has to exist. And that's what has to be intersected with the, the, the curve of the nonlinearity. So I think in that sense, every single method that can be devised is gonna come down to calculating the position of that line. Oh, and then one other thing. Um, this is, in some ways, it's simplified. Um, I cheated a little bit because I made the assumption that the nonlinear element, first of all, there's only one nonlinear element, and second of all, it only has two terminals. So the, I'd say the generalization of this idea is that if we had a three-terminal element, um, then you know, there's basically two potential currents going between the two pairs of, of terminals. We have three terminals. Um, there, there can be basically two currents that are shared among those three terminals. And um, in that case, the linear system then, instead of presenting a line, it's gonna present a plane in space. Because all the equations in the linear system, the key thing is that they're all, they're all linear equations. So if we have three terminals that are connecting to nonlinear elements, we have a plane. If we have more than three terminals, then it becomes a hyperplane. But the, the key thing is that it's always a linear equation. So um, unless two nonlinear elements are connected directly to each other, the, the, by far the most common procedure that we're gonna do is it's gonna just be to always find the intersection of one straight line or one plane and then one nonlinear curve. Okay, so the first method I want to talk about is nodal analysis, and I'm just going to kind of give some details of how you'd set it up. Basically, nodal analysis, um, what we do is we'll just find all the nodes or places where components are connected to each other in the circuit, and we're going to apply Kirchhoff's current law to each one of those nodes. So the law states, um, just from conservation of charge, that if we add up all the currents that are entering the node, the sum of those currents has to be zero. Um, so if, if you wanted to be more explicit, um, basically in this case we have a couple of resistors uh, that are connected between the nodes and then there's a capacitor. So um, we're going to end up producing a vector of node voltages that we're going to try to solve for. So um, in this environment, um, 
the set of unknowns is just the voltages at every node of this circuit. And so what we'd like to do, if possible, is we'd like to write expressions for all the currents entering the nodes uh, in terms of those voltages themselves, because that way we'll be able to solve the system. We'll have a bunch of equations in terms of those unknown voltages. And with the resistors, it's easy to do that. We end up with a bunch of what we call admittance terms. So um, each current through one of the resistors is basically the voltage across the resistor, which we can write in terms of the, the node voltages. And then it has to be normalized or divided by that resistance value. So we're going to get a bunch of additive terms. And these admittance terms just uh, get collected together. And then uh, in this case, we also have a capacitor here. And for now, all I'm going to say about it is just that we have to account for that current. But right now, we don't know what it is. So I'm just going to put a literal expression there for that capacitor current and add it in. Because we have to satisfy the Kirchhoff's law. And so that is one of the current paths. So for now, we'll just include it. And we can worry about it later. Um, and then basically, we repeat this process. So on the second node, we'll have a similar set of equations. Basically, they look the same, but they're modified to apply to that node. And um, so if we have a circuit with n nodes, that means we have n unknowns, because the voltage at each node is unknown. But then we also have n equations, because we can apply the Kirchhoff's current law to each one of the nodes. So this is going to be a, a solvable system. We have n equations and n unknowns. Um, and as I said, uh, all these resistive components basically are additive, and that the, the currents will add up. And each one is a linear function of two node voltages, and it's uh, normalized by a reciprocal uh, resistance, or you'd say an admittance. And because of that, um, we can end up with the idea of an admittance matrix. Or basically, if I write these equations in matrix form, I end up with each row of this matrix is the application of the current law to one of the nodes. Um, so for example, if I have a circuit that just has a single resistor between nodes J and K, um, two of the equations that I'd have would enforce the Kirchhoff law on node J and then on node K. And each one of those equations has two terms with that R appearing in it, because um, the, the current is due to the difference in voltage across that resistor. So essentially, the, app, the insertion of that resistor into the system gives us four matrix elements. And um, what's really nice about this method is that uh, all these terms are additive. So when we want to generate this, um, this matrix, we can basically um, add up the contributions of each resistor separately. So this is great for automated systems. If you have a, a list of a bunch of components that you want to add together, you can construct the, the matrix without really doing any analysis. Basically, each contribution from one of the resistors can be put in very simply um, because these terms I'll add. So if, if I have an existing circuit and then I want to add this component in, I can stick it in there. And then this matrix uh, will just have additively um, we'll just have additively changed these four elements. So that's how we do the contributions from a, from a resistor. The other thing we need to know how to do is to insert a current source. And if we have an independent source, we basically um, we have to account for those terms being added to the Kirchhoff equations. But since those currents don't depend on the node voltages, they won't go into the admittance matrix. Every term in that matrix is going to get multiplied or be a, a linear function of these voltages. So the resistive terms get multiplied by the vector, but the, the terms from this current source just go on the right-hand side. So now we've introduced the idea of a, of a vector that just has all of the sources in the circuit. OK? And between those two things, we can account for pretty much everything. Um, so for example, at this node uh, k, we have one contribution of current that's from the resistor. And it's basically the current through that resistor, which is accounted for in the, in the admittance matrix. And then we have the current source i, which is just literally added into the right-hand side. That's the vector of all the sources. OK? So if we recast that in the matrix form, all we need to do is come up with a name for that, that right-hand side vector. And I'm just going to call it s. It has sources in it. And basically, it's going to end up having the states of all the reactances uh, as well. And so basically, all we have to do to solve this system is we have to invert that admittance matrix and move it over to the right-hand side. So just like in the case of the delay-free loop, we're going to have one matrix inversion that happens at setup. And then when we want to advance time, we're just going to multiply our state vector, which has all the sources, inputs, and states of the reactances by that inverted matrix. So it's, it's pretty efficient uh, to use once you go through the setup of uh, inverting that potentially large admittance matrix.
Okay, so now we have to know how to include reactances. And this is a, uh, one of the elements that uh, is a little less obvious, I'd say. Basically what happens is we want to directly apply whatever differencing scheme we chose to the reactive elements separately, one by one. So each reactive element is discretized on its own. So in this case, uh, I decided to use a backward difference. The definition of the backward difference is if we have a function which is integrating something, um, the difference in that function between two successive samples by the backward difference is just the sampling interval t times the derivative of that signal evaluated at the, at the most recent sample. So it's a projection backwards into time. But um, for the purposes of this environment, basically that backward difference, what it does is it, it just gives us an algebraic equation that relates the voltage at time k plus 1 to a previous voltage and to the current at time k plus 1 through that capacitor. And so um, if we think of it just as an abstract algebraic equation, we can solve it for any one of the quantities. And if we decide to solve for the current, we can get an expression for the current at time k plus 1 as this being a function of two things. First, it's a function of the voltage at a previous time k. And that we would consider to be the state of the capacitor. So basically, that term, um, it's not a simultaneous solution because the voltage on the capacitor at time k is already known. That's a previous value. Um, so that gets modeled as just the current source. That's a component of the current. And then the other uh, contribution to the current at time k plus 1 is this term which is proportional to the voltage also at time k plus 1. So we have this kind of, it's like a mini delay-free loop. We basically have just an equation that's relating the current in the capacitor to the voltage at the very same time. And so if we want to visualize what that is in terms of a circuit, it would be a resistor because a resistor is the element that we know um, has a linear uh, proportionality between current and voltage. So um, this thing is called the linear companion model. And, it's, and what we do is we insert this. It's, it's actually a Norton equivalent. So it's a current source and a resistor that are in parallel. And we replace every reactance in the circuit with this. And basically, um, what that circuit does is since we've removed all the reactances, the circuit now becomes um, memoryless. We just have a bunch of elements which are, have no concept of time. So there's one solution for this circuit, which just exists for all of time. And what that solution is, is it's a, it's a one-step prediction into the future. So in other words, if I have the entire state of a circuit at time k, and then I want to find out what is the state of that circuit going to be at time k plus 1, this, if I replace all the reactances with these type of, of models, the static solution of that circuit will give me the one-step prediction into the future. So I think the presence of the current source and the resistor are more of a visualization tool. They kind of give us a, a circuit-based understanding of the mechanics of what that algebraic equation is. But the equation, really what it is, is it's just the enforcement of the differencing scheme that we chose. So um, I had chosen the backward difference, but if I do a bilinear transform, we get a similar thing. It's just that with the trapezoidal rule, we now have also a contribution from the current at an earlier time, time k. But we can have the same model. It's just that the component values are a little bit different. The value of the resistor is different, and the value of the current source is different. But this model basically gives us a, a method to predict the behavior of this circuit jumping forward one sampling interval. OK, so the, 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 the model then is to just uh, construct our circuit replacing all the reactances with these Norton models, and then we can advance time. And basically what happens is um, the value of this resistance depends only on the value of the capacitor. So it's not a time varying quantity. It just has to do with the component values. It also depends on the, um, well, here, I've got it. It depends on the, the sampling interval, and it also depends on the, the value of the capacitor. And it depends on the differencing scheme, so whether we use a bilinear transform or a backward difference. Um, but it's a quasi-static element. As long as no component values change, it's just going to stay constant. And then the, uh, the other component, this circuit, uh, this current source, is basically the state. So that, en that encompasses the, uh, the previous time steps, voltage and current through the capacitor. And it gives us the, just basically the state of the system. And it's that which allows it to, to carry out this time step uh, operation. OK, so if we want to do a simulation, basically we just replace the capacitors with these Norton sources and calculate the, the voltages. Okay.
Um, we can write the Kirchhoff laws just as before, but now we have explicit uh, ways to include the, value, the uh, contribution from the capacitor. Basically, there's a resistive-like term that's due to that Norton resistance, and that can just add up with all the other admittance terms. And then there's a true current source, and this isn't the physical current in the capacitor, remember. This is just the value of that current source that's part of the Norton model. Okay, so that, that's an encapsulation of the, the state the previous sample state of that capacitance. And from that, we can calculate one time step into the future. Okay, so here we have the matrix formulation. And again, I just wanted to show that on the left, we have this matrix which contains a bunch of admittance terms, and they're all constant, static terms. They, they don't change unless the component values change. And then over here on the right, we have all the contributions from sources. So the input is one contributor, and then the states Basically, these current sources are the states of the capacitances. Okay, so we invert the static matrix just as before, and then we can do a time update step. And again, all the states just remain in this one vector. Okay, so we form the, the n by n matrix, we invert it at setup, and then we just do one matrix multiply to advance time. So that, that's basically a summary of how nodal analysis works. Um, now I wanna do the same thing except with state space. Um, with state space, uh, we have a little bit different point of view. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna express the system as a whole set of separate but coupled first order differential equations. Basically, we write expressions in terms of the reactive components. So our state vector is gonna contain some kind of a, a state measurement for each one of the reactances in the circuit. So for example, we could use capacitor voltages and inductor currents um, to give us the states, and that would work just fine. There's one thing um, I wanted to mention. There is a benefit. There's a way that you can normalize the currents and voltages on the reactances uh, so that you get a kind of a, a state vector which has a square root energy um, um, you know, quantity. So basically the energy in a, a capacitor is one half CV squared. The energy in inductor is one half Li squared. So if we normalize the voltages and currents by the square root of those capacitor and inductor values, you end up with a state vector which has root energy in every element of that vector. And it turns out that's a really great um, property to have because um, if you have a passive system, um, it turns out that, that that state energy never increases unless energy is put in by the input. So there is some stability considerations due to the state space operation that if you work in this energy space, you can do a lot of manipulation with uh, t uh, time. Like if you're smoothing coefficients, you can basically enforce the idea that a system will uh, remain passive. So um, I don't think I have time to really talk about that much today, but uh, if anybody has questions about it, just ask me later. Um, anyway, the, the, the state space model in general is we're gonna write down all these differential equations, a bunch of first order equations for each reactive component. And then what we wanna do is separate the contributions of the derivatives of that state vector into contributions from the states themselves, which go into one term, and then we'll have other contributions that are only from the inputs to the circuit. So we have kind of a separation of the components of that derivative, some due to the states and some due to the inputs. Um, so for example, if we have a first order uh, system here, we can basically um, write that differential equation, and if we separate the terms, we end up with the derivative of that capacitor voltage being uh, one term which is proportional to that voltage itself, and then there's a second term which is proportional to the input voltage. So um, that's basically the state space outlook. And we can do the same modeling that we did with the nodal analysis. Um, I've written these, these uh, differential equations. Basically, they're in terms of the currents. So the derivatives of the capacitor voltages are just based on the currents going into those capacitors. So, um, and in this case, all those currents are coming through resistors. So, I've written down the equations for the sizes of those currents, and uh, those become the differential equations that govern the behavior of the system. And now if I uh, carry out this separation, I end up with one matrix which gets applied to the capacitor voltages themselves and gives us a state update equation, and then there's a contribution from the inputs which is separate. So that's the, I would say, the state space form. Um, now we have to apply a differencing scheme. And in this case, instead of applying the differencing to the components separately, uh, we do it to the whole system all at once. So basically we'll just, I'm gonna do the same thing that we did before. I'm gonna apply the backward difference uh, scheme. 
but I'm just going to apply it to that whole state vector. So that means each element of our state um, we're going to represent with the backward differencing. So the derivative of that, if you remember, is um, basically ax plus b times the input. That derivative, if we multiply by the, by the uh, sampling interval and then we evaluate it at the time k plus 1, that's a definition on the backwards difference. So we've, we've applied the backwards difference method to the, the uh, continuous time system. And in the end, it's going to turn out that we have to invert this matrix. Um, so it, it's very similar to the nodal analysis in that at setup, we have to invert a matrix. But then in order to advance time, we're just going to multiply by a matrix. So we have an efficient way to do our time updates once we get the system set up. And now here's, I'm sorry, I apologize for showing this. This is really messy. And I know nobody wants to look at it. And I'm not going to force you to look at it. But I want to say one thing about it. And that is, um, I've got at the top here the state space update equation. And then down at the bottom, I have the update equation for the nodal analysis system. And if you look at them, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same transition matrix. And that has to be true. And we know it has to be true because in this case, we use the same differencing scheme. We use the backward difference for both the nodal analysis model and the state space model. And so the, the, the quantities that we're actually computing don't depend at all on the choice of modeling. They only depend on the differencing scheme. So these two models are entirely equivalent. Now, I, I'll mention that I did, I sort of, I wouldn't say cheated, but I, I sort of cheated a little bit in that um, I picked a system on purpose where the reactive states, in other words, the voltages on these two capacitors um, are exactly identical to the node analysis states. Because there's only two unknown nodes in the system, and both of them are represented exactly by voltages on the two capacitors. So, I purposely picked a system where it's very easy to do the comparison, and that is why we get this absolute um, similarity between the, the two setups. Um, if we were to choose some other system, what happens in general is that the size of the matrix and the size of the vector of unknowns is different. Usually it's higher with the, the nodal analysis method because we usually have more circuit nodes than we have reactances. So we, we couldn't set up this correspondence. But my belief is that even in those cases, the output generated by those two modeling schemes um, will be identical. So it really comes down to just the differencing scheme. OK, and as I said, the, the nodal analysis matrix is much bigger in general because we have to have an element for every node in the entire circuit. We could end up with a lot of nodes. But what's good about it is that the nodal analysis matrix tends to be quite sparse because we usually don't have every element in a circuit connected to every other element directly. Usually there's some elements that are locally connected to other elements that are nearby. So that matrix not only is sparse, but it's also really easy to generate. I'd say that the state space uh, scheme, the elements of the matrix can be slightly harder to calculate, but there's a lot fewer of them. And so numerically, the methods will be different, and computationally, they'll be different. But again, they're, they're, they're going to comp compute the same thing. OK, so now, finally, um, I'm ready to add nonlinearities into our, our system. So, I decided to start with a very simple nonlinearity. We just have a two-terminal element, the diode, and I'm going to represent it by the Shockley equation. We have the, the current being an exponential function on the voltage that's applied to the diode. And it ends up that, um, for this particular case, that equation is invertible. So I can write the current as a function of the voltage, but then equally easily, I can write the voltage as a function of the current. OK, so what happens if we put a resistor in series with that diode? So a funny thing happens. It turns out that it's still quite easy to write the voltage across that system in terms of the current going through it. The fact that the two components are in series means that we can just add the voltages together. But now, it's not any longer analytically to write an equation for the current in terms of the applied voltage. We end up with a transcendental equation, and we're going to be forced to do some kind of an iterative solution. So this is, this is unfortunate. I mean, we have possibly the simplest circuit that we could possibly make that combines one linear element, zero reactances, and one nonlinear element, and we can't uh, have an analytic solution. So um, we're going to have to do something um, to do a successive approximation or an iteration. And I want to talk about just one of those methods because it's uh, the most uh, common method for doing these iterative techniques. And we'll start out just uh, showing the, the diode voltage current relationship. And basically, um, what we're going to do is derive uh, what you call an incremental model. And basically, the incremental model is a linear system that at some point around which we are going to do an expansion, 
has both the same bulk resistance and the same incremental resistance as the nonlinear element. So in this case, if we're expanding around this point, VD, ID, that this one current voltage doublet uh, for the diode, we basically construct a straight line because we want to model this with a linear system. And that straight line has to pass through the point of expansion and it has to have the same slope as the, the diode current function. And so um, it turns out we can accomplish that also with a Norton source. And the resistance of that source is related to the slope of the line. And then the, the current source basically will shift that line upwards and downwards uh, to get it so that we can have the correct bulk resistance. So um, using that incremental model, we can make an iterative solution. Basically, um, if we construct a linear system that just has this Norton source and then the series resistance, it's easy to solve that linearized system because there's no nonlinear equations in it. So for any applied voltage, we can get easily the voltage across that diode. We just have a superposition of two constant sources and two resistors. If we solve for the, the diode voltage, we then uh, can update or pick new values for uh, the lowercase r and i. In other words, these, these Norton elements, basically whatever point we arrive at for the diode voltage, we'll do a new expansion around that point. And if we do that, we can then resolve the system for a new point VD. And it turns out that if we do something like that and then we just repetitively keep applying those same two operations, what we're doing is actually a Newton step. Um, and so we will converge to the actual solution. So the true solution basically um, has to satisfy a couple of conditions. We have to satisfy the voltage and current relationship for the diode itself. We have to satisfy this actual <coughs> nonlinear relationship. Um, and then if we define um, the voltage across the diode, uh, we have a couple of other equations at our disposal. One, we know that the voltage across the resistor is just the applied voltage minus the voltage across the diode. And then we have the V equals IR relationship of the resistor itself. And then finally, we also know that the current through the diode is the same as the resistor current because they're in, in series with each other. Okay, so um, those are the things we have to satisfy. Here's a graphical representation of how that incremental model produces a Newton step. Basically what we're doing is if we expand around a certain point, we get this black dashed line and that's our incremental model. And the hope is basically just that if the solution is anywhere near that point, our linearized model stays at least in the localized region somewhat close to the actual curve because it has the same value at the expansion point and it has the same derivative. So if in some window, it's, it's hoped that it'll be close to the actual nonlinear function. So anyway, um, since it's a linear model, uh, what we're doing basically is it's easy to, to find the intersection of that straight line with this red line. The red line is basically, um, you know, a couple minutes ago I was talking about load lines and how the linear part of the circuit will present a linear load line to a nonlinearity. That's exactly what this red line is. In this case, it's trivial because it's just the voltage across that resistor. But if that thing were not a resistor but some reactive uh, linear system that's got a whole bunch of components in it, it would still be the same thing. Um, it would just be that this red line would now be a function of time because part of the positioning of that line would depend on the states of the reactive components. Okay, so at any rate, um, it's a linear equation now because we have the linearized incremental model of the diode and then we have the other linear function for the linear part of the system. If we find the, the intersection of those two lines and take that as the next estimate of the diode voltage, now we can do a re-expansion, another incremental model around that operating point. And you can see now if we project along that line where that intersects with the red line is much closer to the true solution. And if we just keep doing this process, um, we're gonna finally arrive you know, arbitrarily close. We can get as close as we wish to the, to the true intersection. You know, the, the point that we're trying to find is the, the intersection between this red line, the load line of the linear system, and the blue line, which is a nonlinear device. Okay, so now knowing that, let's go ahead and add uh, those diodes into the system that we've modeled already. So uh, first I'm gonna add uh, a pair of diodes into that, that nodal analysis system. Um, by placing the diodes back to back, it just makes a more symmetric uh, nonlinearity. And if I add up the two uh, Shockley equations, basically we end up with a model where the current through that diode is just gonna be the hyperbolic sign of the voltage that's applied to it. Okay, so um, there's, there's one little detail that's a little bit messy. If, if, we, whoops. if we want the uh, 
if we want to have an efficient way to solve the nodal analysis method, um, we have to be very careful about how we apply the nonlinearities. So essentially, um, we're going to have to iterate each sample to find the solution um, between uh, this nonlinear element and the linear system. And every time we do an iteration, the value of this lowercase r, the incremental value of that uh, effective linearized resistance, is going to change. So um, we, if we put that r into the large admittance matrix that has all the resistive elements in the, in the system, that means we have to re-invert that matrix, not only every sample, but every time we iterate. And so that's a huge penalty, and it's, uh, it would just be fantastically expensive to do that. So instead, what we do is we just take the bulk diode current, and we just take it as an unknown. And we're going to introduce that into the system on the right-hand side. So let me, I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, basically, we could, if we're going to add a resistive element to a circuit, um, if we add the 1 over R terms into that uh, admittance matrix, basically, it's like adding the currents through that resistor into the Kirchhoff laws, which is totally valid. But um, if they're inside this Y matrix, um, and they're changing, the values are changing, then that's what causes us to have to, to um, invert that matrix over again. Because if we want to apply our time step, we have to have the inverse of that admittance matrix. Okay, so that's what we're trying to avoid. The other thing we can do is we can just add the current through that new element, whether it's a resistor or a diode or whatever, we can add it into the source and state vector over here on the right-hand side. And again, the Kirchhoff laws are really the same. It's just now we're directly adding whatever that current is into each Kirchhoff equation. So instead of having it go into the admittance matrix, we're just literally adding that component on the right-hand side. So now the matrix Y is not time varying, and that means we don't have to keep inverting it. But there is a penalty that we have to pay because now um, we have these unknown terms, I sub R, that we've introduced into our state vector. And so if up till this point, uh, S has only contained previously known states of the reactances and inputs, which are also known. So basically, every element of S up till this point has been a known quantity. So when we do our time update step, we would get numerical outputs for all the, the node voltages. So we just have a solution. Now. we've basically introduced a literal expression for an unknown current onto the right side of this equation. And that means that when we evaluate it, the new expressions now are we'll get linear equations for all the node voltages in terms of that unknown current. In other words, we get a bunch of linear equations that are expressing the, the relationship between V across this new element and the current through it. So again, we have this little mini delay-free loop because we have two unknowns and um, now we basically need two equations to solve them. So um, the easy way to do it is if we just if we take the Kirchhoff equation, or not the Kirchhoff equations, but the solutions for this time update step, we'll get we can get an equation for each of the two nodes that the element is connected to, which will be linear functions of that unknown current. And if we subtract them, we end up with an expression that relates the voltage across the new component in a linear way to the current through the component. So this is basically our load line. So this, this is the exact thing that we want to generate. This is the, the very simplest description of the entire linear system as viewed from that port. So um, if you have a big system that's all linear components and you put one nonlinearity, um, this, this linear load line is the very thing that we most want to get because it's the simplest description at any given time of um, of what that, that linear system presents at that set of terminals. So um, again, we, we now have two unknowns and two equations. We get one equation from the component itself. So in this case, we just have V equals IR for the resistor. The other linear equation is the one that we derived from the rest of the circuit by looking at our, our nodal analysis update step. And by including this current over there uh, in the source vector, um, we now just have a system of two equations and two unknowns. So, we've gained something really huge in that we don't have to invert the admittance matrix. And that admittance matrix, if we have a large circuit, could be enormous. Um, but we've lost something because now we have to solve a two by two matrix every uh, sample, okay? But um, what's gonna happen is if, if this isn't a resistor but a nonlinear component, 
we're going to have to do that anyway, no matter what scheme we use. Um, OK, so anyway, um, just to recap, basically, it's a little confusing because the reactive elements basically have Norton equivalents. And remember, those aren't true equivalents. They're basically these, I would say, visualizations that enforce the differencing scheme that we picked. So uh, these allow us to carry out a time update step. And um, you know, but, but, but those, those are what represent the reactances. And in those cases, the resistive component never changes. So those components can just be placed directly into the admittance matrix. The, the, um, the diode model, we can't do that. that the, the incremental model of the diode also is handled by a Norton uh, model because um, you know, that's how we expand around an op operating point. We just want a, a linear system. Um, but that, the resistance of that model is going to be changing every time that we update the operating point at which we're trying to solve for the, the diode current. And so those are the currents that we're going to put over on the right-hand side of the equation. So it would look like this. If we add a diode, we just literally add the diode currents in on the right, end up with a couple of linear equations, and then this is that load line that we've been talking about. This is the, the very simple description. At every sample time k, it gives us that straight line, which represents the interaction between the entire linear system and then the nonlinear component that we wanted to connect to it. OK. Um, so here it is presented again. We have the one linear equation. and then. Now we're going to have to iteratively solve with this nonlinear equation. And we know how to do that. That's the same thing that we did with just the resistor and the diode, the Newton steps. So we can carry that out, and it'll work exactly the same way. OK, um, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to skip something. Um, but I want to repeat this process with state space modeling just to show that it comes out exactly the same, which it does. Um, basically, for state space, what we're going to do is we're going to make um, the current that goes into the nonlinear element that we added, in this case, the diode, we're going to make that an input to our sp state space system and just keep it as a literal term. And then it turns out, in this case, the voltage across the diode is one of our states because the diode is in parallel with this capacitor. So essentially, um, we have access to that voltage just as an output of our state space system. So here's what it looks like. Um, if we add another term to our input, which is an unknown diode current, we basically can get an expression um, at, at any given time for um, our states. And if we take this top state, the voltage on, the, on capacitor number one, that is the diode voltage because um, they're in parallel. And so the state space update basically gives us that voltage as a linear function of the diode current. So this, again, is our little mini delay-free loop. We have a, a, an equation for two unknowns, and then we're going to supplement that with one other nonlinear equation uh, for the diode itself. So the mechanism of doing this is, again, exactly the same as it was for the nodal analysis scheme. Um, we end up with this one straight line and then one nonlinear equation for the nonlinear component. Then we just have to simultaneously solve them. So um, these methods, and I would argue any, any method at all of doing um, circuit analysis with a nonlinearity, it comes down to this, this process where we just have to produce a load line um, that gives us a linear equation against which we want to solve for the nonlinearity. Uh, here's the output of the system. There's only one plot because the, the uh, state space and the nodal analysis give the same result as we would expect them to. Um, there, are, there are, as I mentioned, some differences, and they're, they're mostly computational. Um, you know, the matrices, again, tend to be smaller for the state space scheme. Um, but, you know, in the end, the, the calculation uh, in both cases is just set up so that we can get this interaction. We want to get a linear description of what the linear system looks like at any point in time as viewed from the terminals to which the nonlinear element is going to be connected. Um, so I had some time varying stuff that I wanted to talk about, but I can condense it really quickly. Basically, there's a way to do a, a bilinear transform where you keep track of time varying components. Um, basically, if you upfront decide that the component values are going to be functions of time, you can put the expressions keeping track of the time um, updates inside the bilinear transform. And then we'll get expressions for how to update the coefficients of our filters. And it ends up, it's, it's very surprising. It turns out if you're going to use a direct form filter, you know how we have all these different filter forms. We have the transposed forms and the direct forms. Um, each one of those forms actually requires a different scheme for updating filter coefficients if you want to model an instantaneous change in a circuit's component values. 
And you can calculate how to do it, but it's complicated. And um, some of the coefficients for the direct form filters actually will take on three separate values as a function of time. There will be kind of a slow evolution, um, and the coefficients will change at different times. Um, it's a little bit of bookkeeping, but if you trace through this bilinear transform, you can come up with the correct way to do it. Anyhow, if you don't do that, you'll get all kinds of artifacts um, when you try to do a, a, a time varying um, evolution, except um, it turns out that for both state space and nodal analysis, if we constrain the component value changes to happen exactly on sample boundaries, so um, if I have R as a function of T, and I enforce the idea that it's completely constant, except on the sample boundaries it can change to a new value. If we do that enforcement, then with no extra work at all, both the state space and the nodal analysis methods will give the correct results for time varying systems. And so um, I did a little model here of just a, a really simple undamped LC resonant circuit, excited it with an impulse, and then at some later time, uh, I changed both this, the capacitor and inductor values by the same factor. And if you do an analytic solution to this in continuous time, what happens is that circuit should um, have it, the frequency of oscillation change, but the amplitude will not change um, because the, there's a proportional change in the values of the L and the C. And so uh, what should happen is that the oscillation should just continue at the same amplitude. But um, one way you can think of it is that since the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over Cs and the impedance of an inductor is Ls, um, if I scale both the L and C by the same amount, it's kind of um, in some way equivalent to scaling S. And that's it's basically a time scaling operation. So if you look at the impulse response of this thing, it's at the point in time where I make this component change, just because of the fact that I change them proportionally, we should just get a contraction or an expansion of the time base. So it's very easy to verify whether this thing is working correctly. And um, so I, I did three different methods. There's a state space model, nodal analysis model, and then I evaluated the transfer function, just, just calculated directly, and then I implemented that with a transpose direct form filter and plotted the results. And um, as you can see, what happens is when I change the component values, both the state space and the nodal analysis methods give identical results, and they're also uh, in good agreement with the, the analytic function. So um, if, you, if you were to just analytically calculate that impulse response with the instantaneous component value changes, this is the exact thing that you would get. Um, the direct form doesn't work nearly as well, and it's because of this um, propagation problem with the coefficients. Basically what happens is that the coefficients are operating on delayed uh, values of the, of the filters, inputs and outputs, and they get out of sync with each other. So it can be corrected, but it's really a quite, a, quite a bit of bookkeeping. It's more than you'd expect. If you have a, a higher order filter, it takes a lot of work to, to do the, the updates correctly. So um, I just wanted to point out that that's another benefit. Even if you don't have a nonlinear system, if you just want to change component values, you can buy yourself, um, well, you can eliminate a lot of headaches just by choosing one of these two methods, because then you don't have to worry about the time updates. You can just change the components. Um, so that's really the end of uh, what I had. Um, so I guess I'll, I can just stop there. Thank you, David, for this inspiring talk. Uh, do we have questions? One back here. How many, how many Newton steps do you have to do typically? Well, that's a good question. It, it, uh, well, first of all, um, I'll say that everything I talked about today was uh, a, basically a Newton step over one dimension. So uh, we're assuming that we have one function of one parameter. And in that case, um, the number of steps that are required depend heavily on just the shape of the nonlinearity. So you could imagine there are some cases where Newton steps will not converge at all. There's a lot of functions where, depending on the starting point of a Newton scheme, if you start far away from the solution, it could converge extremely slowly or not at all. Um, if you're in the neighborhood of the solution, in other words, if you're pretty close to the solution, then the convergence uh, approaches um, the, you know, the square of the number of iterations. So you get a huge benefit for each successive iteration. Um, so it becomes super effective once you get close. But I'm afraid that I, I couldn't say uh, with certainty just for an un, you know, indeterminate system how many iterations would be required. It, it, it just really strongly depends on what the function is. Also, if the function isn't differentiable, you have a, a huge problem. And I would say that you, you probably can't use the method at all. <laughs>
Um, there's other methods that you can use instead of a, a, a Newton step. There's, there's a much slower method called a bisection where basically you define an interval and if you know the solution is inside that interval, you can keep evaluating points. You take the midpoint of an interval and if the error is monotonic, you can kind of bound the solution to be in either half of the interval. And then every time you evaluate that interval, uh, if you do it in the center, you get one bit of accuracy. There's another thing called a false position method. And basically instead of, it's like a bisection in that you have a bound on, on the interval where the solution exists. But instead of taking the center of the interval, um, you evaluate the two endpoints of the interval and you linearly interpolate the error of those two points and wherever that crosses zero, um, um, you basically, you know, use that as your, as your estimate. Um, that, that method has the potential to converge faster than um, a bisection, but it also can converge very slowly depending on what the shape of the nonlinearity is. So um, there's also a generalized thing that's just called a fixed point iteration, which um, you essentially, if you have a loop, you can, you can assume a value for something and then just propagate it all the way around the loop and get a new value. And uh, that thing has a lot of stability questions, but there's a way that it can be related to the Newton step. So um, I think if you have a relatively smooth function, the Newton step is still a really good choice, but um, you have to be really careful. And unfortunately, I don't think there's any uh, real good method to predict, you know, how many iterations you'd have to do. And then if you get into multiple dimensions, then you have a really big problem. And that's partly why I didn't talk about that today. It's kind of, I'd say that's the biggest problem facing anyone who's doing nonlinear circuit modeling. If you're in multiple dimensions, I think setting up the problem is pretty well understood. Uh, like I said, the linear part of the system, instead of giving a line, will just give you this plane in however many dimensions you're in. But then the, you, you can have uh, a lot of localized problems if you're searching for the solution, and it can just get extremely expensive. Um, there are um, circuit simulation programs like PSPICE, for example. Uh, what, what is uh, the difference? Yeah, PSPICE, as far as I know, uses something that's very close to what I've been calling the nodal analysis yeah. method. and. Um, I think the biggest difference between piece of spice and what I've just been talking about is that there's an iter there's a there's a a variable time step in piece of spice where basically you'll jump forward a certain amount in time and then you also evaluate a point that that doesn't have as big of a time step yeah. and if you do two small time steps and then one large time step and you compare the the two different answers you get if they're not pretty close to identical then you know that your time step is too big and um, that type of an algorithm is great for accuracy, um, but it's not really good for real-time systems because the, the cost is unknown. Like if you get into trouble, um, you don't, it, unless you put a bound on how much you're gonna subdivide the, the time interval, um, it, it gets really expensive. So um, I think that's probably the, the most fundamental difference between what, what the SPICE algorithm does um, and what we've talked about today. Okay, thank you. One more question in the back. Hi, yeah, I'm just wondering, supposing that your nonlinearity is much more poorly behaved, like you had the diode equation and that has a nice unique solution with the load line, what if you had a squared function and there were two different solutions with the load line? What do you do then? Well, it depends. Um, if the two solutions are an artifact of how you set up the problem, then what you have to do is figure out which one of the solutions is valid. So like, for example, um, you could model a component as having a, the current be the square of some voltage, but maybe only one half of that function is actually valid and the current is actually zero. Like say you wanted to use a parabolic approximation for a diode. You could say, you know, the current through this diode is approximately equal to the square of the voltage applied to it over some range. But that, that region of validity would, ha would depend on how you set it up. And then if you put a, a, a negative voltage, that would be invalid. So you'd have to choose it that way. Now, there's another completely different case where there are circuits that do have two uh, points of stability. And those, those are always uh, circuits that have a state. So they go into one state, and then according to what that state is, um, you can have a kind of a quasi-stable region where if you know the current state, you can pick the correct solution. But um, that's, that's not a common problem. So I think it's much more likely that people will set up something and you'll end up with some nonlinearity that you've devised in hopes that it will you know, approximate a function that you're trying to use, and then it'll just have some bounded region of stability, or of, of applicability, and you just have to somehow ensure that you're in that region. Now, if um, the other problem about just 
whether the Newton step will converge, I think the only bulletproof way to get around that is to do something more like a bisection. And even that isn't completely bulletproof because if the, if the error is not monotonic um, or if there's more than one solution um, within the initial interval that you're examining, then it, you could get confused or get a, a wrong solution. But I'd have to say that those situations aren't that common from what I've found. Um, the circuits that I've modeled tend to, to be pretty well behaved. I, I haven't seen a lot of circuits that either have actually a lot of s solutions that you have to pick from uh, or ones where the, the error is really ill-behaved. Do we have another question? No, then thank you again. <laughs>